Hi there. Welcome back to the Sociology of Health and the Family, week number two. Um, you know, if you look at the syllabus for this week, then you'll see that we'll be working our way through chapters uh, 15 and 12, but I, I should say mostly chapter 15, in addition to an extraneous chapter from Zygmunt Bauman, the contemporary sociologist, very well regarded, very well known sociologist, um, who uh, wrote a book on death, and I just kind of extracted a little bit from it. So I labeled the module for this week, sociological and psychological perspectives and frameworks, but I think I could have just as easily added, you know, and psychoanalytic perspectives. But in any case, um, the titles of the chapters are as follows. Chapter 15 from the textbook, sociological perspectives on work and the family, Chapter 12 from the textbook, Psychological Perspectives on the Work-Family Interface. And then we have that section from Zygmunt Bowman's book, uh, Mortality, Immortality, and Other Life Strategies. So before going forward, I want to repeat something that I've, been, that I've said in, well, my introductory sort of greeting video, but also the very first week video for this course which is that I really like you to focus more on the lecture material than on the actual uh, textual documents that I supply in this course. You know, I was thinking if you're actually reading in depth the, 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 doc, the text that I'm putting online for you or the, the textbook, then I imagine you're going to feel really overwhelmed in this course. And I don't want that. I don't want you to feel totally overwhelmed. I actually want you to feel quite the opposite. I want you to feel quite relieved in this course so that you can uh, use that extra energy that, um, that, that could be causing some strain or anxiety toward thinking um, through uh, some really interesting ideas. So the goal isn't to make you feel overwhelmed. I don't want you to feel that at all. So what I want you to do is to focus just on the lectures once again, um, if you want. Uh, then, you, then if you want, what you can do is while you're doing more research for your assignments or whatever, if you just want more detail or whatever, then you go back and you can look at the text in more detail using the lectures as your guide. Um, you know, and I just wanna, although I've already rationalized this a little bit for you, I wanna add one more reason why I think that's the best approach for you to take. Uh, it's because I work through the course material in a very unique way. I emphasize certain elements from the material. I extract per certain uh, segments from the, from the text, uh, I add to the text, I subtract from the text, I ignore stuff too. But I also, and this point is very important, I also twist and uh, transform the text into something entirely different. That's why the lecture is your primary course material. Okay, so um, let me begin then. I'm gonna begin today with something quite abstract and move towards something maybe a bit more concrete and more tangible for you. So if you're, if the first part of what I have to say to you today feels quite overwhelming, uh, rest assured the relief will come uh, maybe midway through. Uh, first, I wanna talk about death and health. Uh, I say death and health, but I'm not, I think that is the best way. It's not death or health, which is how we tend to think about it. And I'll broach that topic in a moment. So, you know, I want to begin with a deeply theoretical. Some might claim it's uh, philosophical, but I think those people would be mistaken since this is the very stuff of sociological thought. Uh, but it's a deeply theoretical discussion of the concept of health. Uh, first of all, I would draw your attention to the very word health which comes directly to us from, I think, the old and middle English variants, which has always carried a sense of, a sense of wholeness, of being whole, not H-O-L-E, which is the truth of it, but I'll get to that in a moment. It's, but wholeness, like completion, you know, a sense of being whole that is not being fractured, not being broken, not being split or opened up or contaminated by something extraneous, perhaps. Uh, so it's also very close to the word holy. So there, you might think about it also theologically as it once was, it once was thought quite theologically as a sort of holy state of being. Well, you know, it's no wonder so much of health today in the contemporary period uh, occurs as a sort of rejuvenated discussion of 
such things as, oh, I don't know, consider what I'm doing here a bit of a brainstorm, okay? Uh, such things as uh, holistic medicine. We hear a lot about holistic medicine or holism or uh, having a holistic approach and so on. You know, the question we might ask ourselves, and it would be a critical question just by asking the question, don't presume we know what the answer is, but is it possible ever to be whole, to be complete onto oneself? Uh, is that a possibility? Well, I maintain that it might be a desire. We might desire to be whole, to be complete onto ourselves, to have a sense of wholeness, um, or in that sense, a sense of healthiness. Uh, but we can never in of itself be complete, in of ourselves be complete in that respect. We're always contaminated by that which threatens the holism of our ecosystem, if you like. This whole is threatened by, well, it's death or something like death or death, uh, something that's approaching death. We're always, we're always contaminated by the very question of death. Okay, well... I don't just want to play linguistic games, uh, but I do think that these linguistic games are somewhat important. They do point us toward a, in the direction of a rethinking of the basic ideas that we've taken for granted that are perhaps obscured now by ideology without our even being aware of it. Take, for example, that death, the very word death, uh, has always carried, I mean, for, for a very, very long time, has always been closely aligned with the idea of there being a limit, a cessation, if you like, an end. Um, so death always carries the, the meaning of an end or a limit uh, or an interruption. So death then, we might claim, uh, if we're going to put it up against health, we might claim that it's a limit to the very idea of the wholeness of health. Of, uh, uh, it's a very limit to the idea of ever being whole. Uh, and not just to the idea of it, it's to the reality of being whole. Okay, well, it might seem a little bit abstract at this point, even though I'm still at the same time saying something that's quite obvious to all of us, that death is a limit to our health. Uh, but it does seem nonetheless important linguistically, for example, to speak of health and the family implies, I think, that we're speaking about the integrity of the family. That is the family being complete onto itself, a whole, a unit, without any extraneous or intervening or threatening or contaminating elements that would disrupt that wholeness or uh, holiness, I nearly said, but that would be fine too, holism, if you like. Uh, so to speak about health requires fundamentally that we also speak about death and topics on the periphery of death, illness, and so on. It's not simply that we cannot have health without death, but rather that health, and, and this is a really subtle and difficult point in some respects, so it's not simply that we cannot have health without death, but rather that health has as its basis, fundamentally, something of a death around which the integrity and the health of ourselves and our families and our communities are based. And this is the fundamental insight, the fundamental point that I'm trying to develop um, in relationship to the, to the piece from Zygmunt Bowman. I think it helps to explain why one of our classical sociologists, whose name I hope every one of you are familiar with. You might not remember everything about him, but Emil Durkheim, um, some would claim the founder of academic sociology, but that's debatable. Um, Emil Durkheim, a key sociologist from France, once claimed, and it was in his book, um, The Elementary Forms of Religious Life, a wonderfully provocative book that we don't give enough credit uh, to or read as deeply as we ought to. He once claimed that death is central. Death is central to the formation and the renewal of all social bonds, of all social groups. Um, I'm going to quote him. 
just to give you some evidence that he has said this or, or written this, I, I should say. When someone dies, the family group to which he belongs feels itself lessened and to react against this loss, it assembles. A common misfortune has the same, which is the death, has the same effects as the approach of a happy event. Collective sentiments are renewed, which then lead men to seek one another and to assemble together. We have seen, don't worry, I'll, I'll arrange this so you can see more of this. This need for concentration affirm itself with a particular energy. I'm just going to fix this now. With a particular energy, they embrace one another, put their arms around one another, and press as close as possible to one another. This is on page 400 of the English, the popular English edition. Not that you really need that citation, but okay. So let's read it again. When someone dies, so we're talking about the experience of death in an other, not our own death, but the experience of death in other people, the family group to which he belongs, or she, or they, belongs, feels itself lessened and to react against this loss, it assembles. So it forms a stronger social bond, it comes together. I mean, we can think about this quite uh, simply and naively, like at a funeral, people come together, right? Uh, a common misfortune has the same effects as the approach of a happy event. Collective sentiments are renewed. So now they have a shared understanding of who they are. Let's say there's a loss in the family, unfortunately. Now everybody comes together as a family and now they really feel themselves to be even more a family and they need to reaffirm it because they're afraid of losing the very social bond that defines the family. Which then lead men to seek one another and to assemble together. So they form a social bond after the death. We have seen this need for concentration affirm itself with a particular energy. And here just think of the example of a funeral or something like that they embrace one, one another. They literally are hugging each other, put their arms around one another and press as close as possible to one another. Well, it means that they intensify their social bonds and their social interactions, which implies that death has actually strengthened the social bond, made people closer. It's a really paradoxical idea that death, which is something that we think of as a force that, you, that separates and destroys social groups, is actually the cause of the formation and renewal and intensification of a social bond as well. It's a really paradoxical point, and that's why I'm reiterating it and providing all kinds of different ways of saying the same idea here. Um, okay, so it's around death that social connections, social what I call social bonds, are formed, that uh, familial, but also much more generally social connections are made possible. This was also the position of Sigmund Freud, who make no mistake was a sociologist. We often talk about the late work of Freud as a, as a sociologist when he became much more sociological. But Sigmund Freud, who I think we've all heard of, I'm not going to give any bios or anything like that, but you know, the founder of the psycho psychoanalysis, the psychoanalysis. Well, it's debatable whether he founded it, but okay. Um, well, Freud claimed, you know, all of human society must be built upon the fact that at the very beginning, there was a death of some other person. It was death that formed social bonds, according to Freud, or at least that's one of his insights. Um, it's only because of death of a paternal or father figure for Freud, um, if only metaphorically, something like a father figure, somebody who occupies the position of a father type of function, which is a, you know, it, it could be read in a sexist way like that. Uh, it's only after the death of a paternal figure that a social group 
you know, to appease its mourning, its sense of guilt for perhaps having killed the father figure, that they can come together into their own as a little miniature society, a social bond, a little social group or a tribe, if you like, to, that now will build its own laws to keep that sort of traumatic thing, that death, from happening again. Now they're afraid that it'll happen to them. So they have to form a social group based upon laws to congeal, to cohere into a social uh, unit. Okay, that's Freud's position. Very similar to Durkheim's position, very similar to Bowman's position. Uh, so let's go back to our linguistic game for a moment. If health is wholeness, um, if health is wholeness, and the integrity or stability of a social bond, let's say the familial family social bond, uh, that's our sociological definition, right? Um, and which is, as you can see, it's important that it's quite different from the biological or medical definition of death, right? We're taking a sociological definition of death, which has something to do with social with society or social groups or social bonds. It's not necessarily having to do with the the cessation of the functioning of vital organs or something like that, right? Uh, it's a sociological definition of death. Then, well, if, de if health is the wholeness and the integrity or stability of a social bond, then death is at the same time, I should write this, I think. Death is at the exact same time, both the limit or the end of health, and this, in other words, the social bond, the limit and the end of the social bond, but also paradoxically also the source or the inspiration for a social bond. It's a really paradoxical thing to have these two contradictions there within one space. Uh, death is the limit to a social bond in some sense, but it's also the very source of it. Without the specter of death, there could be no coming together with one another. There could be no social bond. That's the weird thing about it. Uh, there's this French psychoanalyst named, I'm gonna put his name in black just to be provocative, named Jacques Lacan, um, a French psychoanalyst who once um, said, he didn't write it, he said it, death belongs to the realm of faith. You are, you're right to believe that you will die. It sustains you. If you didn't believe it, could you bear the life you have? If we couldn't totally rely on the certainty that it will end, how could you bear all of this? He said this quite spontaneously while giving a impromptu lecture at a university, and you can find a clip of this on the internet. He said, death belongs to the realm of faith. We can interrogate what that means, I'm not going to. He, he sees it as a belief rather than a, certain, the, than, a, than a fact, but it's a certain belief. Uh, you're right to believe that you will die. It sustains you. You see, here's the point. Our belief that we will die is what gives us life, it sustains us. If we didn't believe it, we couldn't bear this life and the suffering that it brings. If we couldn't totally rely on the certainty that it will end, how could we possibly bear all of this? It's a really provocative idea, but you see the point. It's somewhat counterintuitive in that death becomes the very support for the life we have, for our health for our quest for holism and completion, our desire for stability, for integrate, uh, integrity, um, and, and so on. Well, what then, to return to Zygmunt Bauman, I hope I spelled that right, um, what, what does Zygmunt Bauman have to say about all of this? To return to him, I would say, well, make no mistake, one of the, he's one of the most important sociologists of, of our time, perhaps of all time. For him, death is, as it was for Durkheim, as it was for Freud, as it was for Jacques Lacan, key to understanding the formation of our social bonds. And 
I'm putting it under Bowman, but I've showed you that we can find this idea in a lot of different sociological thinkers. I've just thought of a couple here. I could probably probably could have thought of many, many more. Um, death is key to the understanding of the formation of social bonds, such as the family. And you know the root word of fa fa the word family and, and familial is very close to the word familiar. So keep that in mind too. Some linguistic wordplay is not uh, is not so bad. Well, what I tried to do in my own way was I tried to demonstrate this curious fact using the example of COVID last week. Uh, Take, for example, the changes that have taken place in recent history, made most apparent at the time of the pandemic. Uh, changes that have happened in the social bond across, whoops, I don't know how to put this. <laughs> across space and time to return to the idea from last week and maybe develop it a little bit more. Well, our familial social bonds, their relative health, well-being, integrity, stability, holism, however you wanna put it, our familial social bonds are intimately related uh, to these questions of space and time and how our social bond is situated in space and time. On the one hand, the, the um, the space portion, I don't know if you can see my mouse when I kind of hover it over top. I think if I do this, you can. The space portion describes such things as, you know, um, social distancing or social distance. But the, the specter of death, again, it's counterintuitive. The specter of death is not introduced from us being distant from one another but rather, as I've said before, from a feeling of being swallowed up by our proximity to those in our immediate social bonds, such as our family and our roommates and so on. In other words, death comes, the feeling of death, the intrusion of, of, of something like a death um, or the effects of a death come to us via the uh, asphyxiating proximity of others in our, social, in our immediate social bonds. They're too close to us. So we need distance in order to give ourselves some some air to breathe, some, some life. So, you know, simply so that we can breathe again, we have to create space for ourselves, distance. We need a room of our own. On the other hand, time <coughs> relates to this new feeling of um, what I was calling before, I think I called it timelessness, a sense of timelessness. Well, the specter of death touches us as we lose our sense of finitude paradoxically, as we lose our sense of mortality. Uh, we end up being infinite beings suspended in time without a sense of before. You know, when did the pandemic begin? I forgot. When did it begin? I completely forgot. What was it like before? I almost don't remember. Um, or an after. It'll all end one day, right? So we're swallowed up by our own immortality. The virus might not get us if we stay in our homes, but we nonetheless feel frozen in time as if stuck inside of a coffin. Well, it would seem as though death and health then are in some battle with one another. Sociologically speaking, it's like an epic rap battle of history. Do they still do those on YouTube? Epic rap battles of history death and health, it's as if they're in war with one another, and yet it's not that clear. As Sigmund Freud once put it, um, Thanatos, the god, the ancient god of death, of multiplicities, of destruction and separation, it's as if Thanatos is doing battle with the ancient god Eros, the god of life, of love, of unity and uh, creation. You know, death cuts and it separates and it limits and life seems to unite and bring together. But this construction of Freud's, I think, is a bit of a naive one. 
it's trapped in a certain, for lack of a better term, for lack of a better term, uh, ideological conception or ideological configuration. It's not as simple as that death doing battle with health, the Natos at war with Eros and Eros at war with the Natos. There's something, as I've been saying, much more fundamental about and central about death to our very notions of health. Uh, we can't have a notion of health without approaching uh, death. It never, it, it, it never exists independent of, of death. Yet death, and here's how it's not, it's not you know, a simple binary. Uh, health can never exist without the specter of death, but death can exist certainly without health. That's why death is much more central. Well, okay, let me develop it a little bit more. It's, it's, um, it's only gonna uh, be this abstract for just a little bit more and then you'll get some relief and I'll give you more tangible and less abstract material. Uh, Zygmunt Bowman, return to Zygmunt Bowman. Again, I'm not sure I spelled that right. Uh, he wrote that we all know very well what death is. That is until we are asked to give a precise account of what we know about it. To define death as we understood it. Then the trouble starts. It transpires that it is ultimately impossible to define death. Impossible to master it. This is our sociologist, key contemporary sociologist, sounding a bit philosophical, but this is sociology, claiming that, you know, and I should unpack this about a bit. We all think naively that we know very well what death is until we're asked to give a precise account of it. Once we have to start talking about death, what is death? Um, then we start to get into some trouble because it's ultimately impossible to define death. It's impossible to master death. What we can talk about is health and health is a shell of the whole of the traumatic whole of death. So yeah, death is central but neglected as a topic within health, but it's also unavoidable. It's perhaps the very cornerstone of all that we can say about health. We feel healthy because we have temporarily deceived ourselves into thinking that we have avoided death. But death begins with what cannot be mastered. But isn't it the case that health wellness and well-being also cannot be entirely mastered. I mean, uh, just think concretely, forget about the abstract stuff for a minute, just think concretely. We, we know that there's always a limit to our health. We're never 100% healthy. We talk about a clean bill of health and so on, but it, it, which is an interesting expression, I'd love to explore it, but, but we're never 100% healthy. We're instead what a German philosopher who I hesitate to mention for some reason, um, that's very important, Heidegger, German philosopher called, um, we are beings toward death. We're beings always approaching death, always, uh, death is our destiny. It's inevitable. So even health is a part of this specter of death. That's the difficulty of it all, right? We cannot master our health any more than we can master death. And moreover, we cannot master our health precisely because it implies trying to avoid death. We try to grip on to health and we cannot. Um, we feel healthy because we lack the very language to articulate the sickness or deathliness that invades our social bonds, that gives rise to our social bonds, and that paradoxically sustains and maintains our social bonds. Kind of like that expression. I'm going to see if I, these are my words, not um, not uh, quoted from anywhere. We feel healthy because we lack the very language to articulate the sickness 
or deathliness that invades our social bonds gives rise to them and paradoxically sustains them. Um, a reading from the book of Dwayne Roussel. <laughs> um, so, you, you know, to understand something, as Bowman points out in that quote I gave you a moment ago, to understand something is in some way a, uh, a method of, of attempting to master it, and yet death cannot be understood. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's as if in, in trying to understand something, we master it in our mind instead of in reality. I'll give you an example of this from Sigmund Freud. I'm almost at the end of this abstract discussion here. Sigmund Freud, I mean, Freud was observing a little boy named Little Hans. Uh, and to keep things really simple, we would say that the little boy felt a terrible anxiety every time his mother left the room. It's as if, you know, her disappearance was something of a specter of death. She disappeared. She temporarily died in a sense. And as little as, as children, perhaps that's the way our mind works about these sort, sorts of things, right? Well, while observing the boy playing, Freud noticed that he, the boy invented a, a little game, an interesting little game with a piece of wood that was attached to a, a piece of string. He would toss the, uh, the object across the bed and it would fall off the side of the bed, but he'd still be holding it with his string. Uh, and when it disappeared over the end of the bed, he would say the word there, and then he'd pull it back, he'd have it, he'd look at it, he'd say here. Well, what Freud deduced from this was that the little boy's attempt to represent, impossibly of course, the absence of that object, its disappearance, like the disappearance of his mother, or something else that dies or disappears or cannot be seen or represented, uh, happened in language. He, he gained a fictitious understanding of its absence, a fictitious sense of mastery that's quite necessary to overcome the anxiety and the trauma of, of something that cannot be understood, or in other words, the specter of death. So, you know, we go to great lengths to, to master death. Alas, death is the ultimate master. We cannot master death because death is the ultimate master. The very word understanding implies that we try and grasp something, yet de death cannot be grasped. Grasped, <laughs> It eludes always our grasp, or rather it will grasp us from that place beyond our understanding. To, to die is to lose our grasp on life, on health, to lose our stability, our integrity to be swallowed up by the that which is impossible to know. There's nothing left to hold on to, and yet it's because of our death that others may join together and embrace one another into it. They can grasp each other, hug each other into a social bond. Um, Sigmund Bowman writes, the fact of human mortality, death, well, I won't put that in brackets. The, fa the fact of human mortality and the necessity to live with the constant awareness of that fact go a long way toward accounting for many crucial aspects of social and cultural organization of all known societies. It's a really profound uh, discovery, a really profound thought that Bowman's introducing that was there from the very beginning in the psychoanalytic tradition, but not appreciate it. And we find it on the periphery of sociological texts. Many of our social bonds, our social institutions, such as the family, are built as a what Zegman Bowman calls, I really like this word, are built as a life strategy, strategy for life against death, right? are built as a life strategy, as, in other words, as an attempt to find what within death, what within Thanatos can give birth to Eros, to, uh, to what, what within the constant threat of death can give rise to a life impulse, to an impulse to survive, to avoid death, if only temporarily. Bowman's claim is that this knowledge of the impossibility of death of its ability to swallow us up is what gives rise to society as such. J 
just like Freud. Freud made the same claim, right? Society and culture are fundamentally about concealing or covering up death. And the, the family then is in its essence, a place of health and well-being so that it may instill an avoidance of the traumatic reality of death, which nonetheless intrudes into it. Um, I'll give you one example and then move on to more tangible, less abstract stuff. Um, this is something I learned about when I was in India, the Buddha. Uh, my understanding of the story of Buddha is that he lived a really sheltered life within a palace uh, among, amongst royalty. His father and his family and other people in his community at the command of his father sheltered Buddha for the vast majority of his life against the specter of suffering and death. Buddha never witnessed death until a very late age, which is an anomaly. He never witnessed suffering. And then one day when he was quite old, the inevitable of course happened, his mother died. Uh, it was a great, it was of great traumatic consequence for Buddha. It's represented in his story as a transformative moment. Uh, in psychology, we might even refer to it as a psychotic break. Whatever it was, it was quite profound. And it was perhaps uh, single-handedly responsible for making the Buddha an exceptional figure who precisely by being sheltered away from death through the health of his family and ultimately his community, um, ended up making him confront death in a much more traumatic way than he would have if he would have just tasted some of that, unfortunately, nobody wants to, but uh, uh, discovered the, the reality of death and suffering much earlier. Okay, what I want to do now is, um, is move towards something much less abstract to, and, and give you a foundation for some of the theoretical perspectives that guide our course. Uh, but I want to do that by abstracting them mostly from chapter 15, the chapter by Jennifer Glass titled Sociological Perspectives on Work and the Family. You know, the, the chapter outlines a few different perspectives. It's four. I'm going to add a fifth one at the end. Um, and these perspectives, mostly on the relationship of work and the family, but we're going to use them maybe a bit more generally, they include, let's call these sociological perspectives. We'll just call them sociological perspectives. I'll just type them out first and then I'll go through them. There's the symbolic interactionist perspective. There's the ecological systems perspective or perspectives. These should be plural, I should add. Um, the life course perspectives and conflict perspectives or conflict theory perspectives. Well, according to the author, these are really central to understanding sociologically the family. Um, <clears throat> to be fair, I would say they seem to me already to be steeped. Uh, disorientation seems to be quite steeped into a particularly American uh, framework for understanding and assessing the importance of various theoretical perspectives on the family. You know, take for example the the fact that there is a symbolic interactionist uh, perspective right at the very beginning. Uh, that's a resolutely American perspective. I'm actually it's so American. I'm going to put the word American here beside it to remind you. Uh, it's a it's a uniquely American. Uh, theoretical orientation that has emerged in the context of American sociology, which was from the very beginning linked up with um, philosophies of and psychologies that are pragmatist in orientation, uh, practice-based in orientation. Uh, it was first named by the American sociologist Herbert Bloomer. I guess I'll put his name here. Herbert Bloomer was the first to give name to this tradition. Uh, and what he, how did he do it? He sort of retroactively named a group of thinkers as being a part of this tradition before the name symbolic interactionism as an anchoring point even existed. So he sort of went back in time and said, all of these thinkers are symbolic interactionists. We, the same thing's done in a lot of American sociology, like conflict theory, when we get to that. I mean, Karl Marx is only retroactively considered a conflict theorist. Indeed, 
retroactively considered a sociologist since he never thought of himself as either of those. Um, so there's nothing particularly wrong with this approach, uh, but I just want you to be aware that an attentive to the highly ideological moves that are being made here by thinkers, they're motivated by particular, a particular ideological context. They don't know they're doing it, or, um, but I mean, that's the definition of ideology. You don't know you're doing it, yet there you are doing it. Uh, or if they do know, they kind of disavow the fact that it's an ideological uh, motivation for thinking in this particular way. In any case, I'm digressing. What we can take from this chapter is also the fact that the discussion of the relationship of the family to work, so what we would consider the, the topic of, of family and work, which we will talk a little bit about in this class, even though it's not central, um, really goes back to the 1960s. Uh, that's when people really first started sociologically and in depth and, and placing this at the center, uh, studying this sort of, and, and thinking about this sort of stuff. Um, for example, it was discussed by Lewis and Rose Hozer in the late 1960s. I actually think the publication was in the early 1970s, but the author says the 1960s, I might be wrong. They were discussing both family and the work world as greedy institutions. They're greedy institutions because they make a lot of demands upon individuals, right? Um, they demand so much from the individual in terms of time and energy, or if you like, time and space. So there's demands from these inst institutions upon the individual, and these demands have something to do with energy, what we've hitherto referred to as work, um, and time and space, and they do something to the individual in terms of time and space, in terms of their distance or way of thinking about time. So in sociology, there's been research since that time, say the 1960s, on particular aspects of this, of which the author of this particular chapter has listed a few. Um, I'm just going to select a few of those at random, studying, for example, the growth of solo parenting and, that, and the relationship of solo parenting and the workforce or the labor force, the decline of organized labor and labor laws, the childcare crisis, what constitutes childcare and where it occurs and so on, and financing it and these sorts of things. The effects of globalization on workers and immigration and, and these sorts of topics have been central. Well, these are all trends that are studied in, re, in some relation to the health and work of the family, but also especially in terms of what we hear a lot of this expression, the work family or the family work balance. Um, but there are two questions that seem to have dominated this, this, um, this sort of research or thinking within sociology. First, who does the housework and childcare in American Canadian families? And second, what causes the gender wage gap and why does it continue to exist? Okay, these are the, the questions that the author of our text says have been central. Uh, I do see a significant amount of evidence to suggest that this has been quite central to, um, sociolog to sociological questions in this area. Um, you, we can see, for example, that gender has been of major importance in the sociological study of families, of health, and of work. Uh, so the author concludes, and I'm going to quote the author here, the persistence of, of a strong gender division of labor in both families and workplaces has significant consequences for the material wealth and well-being of women and children. So, you know, end quote. So it opens up the question of how, uh, broadly speaking, each sociological perspective has explored this friction of work in the family, has explored the work-life balance. Um, I, wanna, I wanna challenge this word balance, but I'm not going to. Uh, what, 
Well, um, I'm deliberately biting my tongue here because I want to be highly critical of some things. Uh, for example, uh, you know, these perspectives discussed by the author, although we will roll with them and accept them and integrate them into our thinking for this course, they seem less as perspectives than as abstractions. You know, it, it's hard to find where within these traditions there are actual thinkers who fit smoothly within only one of them, for example. Uh, you can't simply pick and choose theories and ideas and use them as representative of entire traditions of thought in the way that th this author has. Uh, this is, I think, part of the problem with the American fascination with schools of sociology or perspectives of sociology, such as, you know, and we list them, structural functionalism, conflict, symbolic interactions, and so on. They abstract from an underlying theoretical context that is much more messy. It's not as clean as this is presented, which is why we seldom read about who's included in these perspectives by this author. Uh, in any case, if you want to really interrogate this, I would encourage you to take some of my sociological theory courses where this is kind of what we're interested in doing, uh, particularly interrogating American sociology of which we are a part. Okay, but let's continue. Let's look at the symbolic interactionist perspective a little bit more. Oh, no. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. Well, let, okay, putting the criticisms to the side, one particular definition of, the symb of symbolic interactionism comes to us from uh, a Canadian, but also American sociologist named Irving, Go Irving Goffman, who I, I hope some of you have heard of. Uh, already we run into a problem because the author groups Irving Goffman in the symbolic interactionist tradition, but many, many people would claim that he's not a symbolic interactionist or that He's a different sort of symbolic interactionist and maybe more of a structuralist. It, it, it's, uh, it's not clear that he's, anyway, but we're gonna put that to the side. Well, Goffman, according to the authors, demonstrates as an exemplary thinker in the symbolic interactionist tradition that social order is accomplished by the routine enactment of social roles. Let's consider this a provisional definition, a provisional definition of what symbolic interactionism is all about. It's not exactly fair, but it's good enough for our purposes. You know, we, be we believe ourselves to have particular roles. This is the social roles part. We believe ourselves to have particular roles as say a professor or within the context of the family, maybe as a father or a caretaker or a child or you know, whatever. Uh, but there are clear, there are usually roles. They're not always clear, actually, like President of the United States, Prime Minister of Canada, Provost, Vice Provost, and so on. These roles are routinized through, routinized means repeated, ritualized, if you like, through acting as if the roles are true, according to a set of criteria that are specified as to how those roles ought to be performed. We try to fulfill these roles by acting as if there is a reality to these roles. So what makes these social roles routinized, 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 is the fact that we believe them to be true. We believe these roles, these performances. Um, we believe that they're not performances at all, but rather are areas of superb competency or essence. It's as if, you know, I'm a professor for some reason, more than the fact that I play the part, but I'm playing a role as a professor, right? Um, which, which has all kinds of gestures, like moving your hands like this and crossing your legs a particular way, maybe, and using particular words. There's all kinds of ways to fulfill the performance that is the role that I've been assigned or that I've taken upon myself. And we often presume these roles to be authentic and essential or true. When the, when the role is not performed adequately or competently or to our expectations, then we witness a deviation, a challenge to that role and a challenge indeed to the integrity or wellness of the social bond that surrounds that role. Let's take the role of the father, traditional, 
gendered role, perhaps. And let's say that traditionally, we might have certain expectations about how that role is to be performed or played with some degree of competency. Well, when the role is no longer played appropriately, then the entire social bond surrounding that role, perhaps the, the, the whole family uh, unit, I say unit because of the wholeness of the supposed family group, um, it's, it's thrown into some anxiety and it must strive to produce a new form of social integration, a new form of integrity for that bond, for that familial bond. So there are various responses to these deviations, to these breakdowns in role performance. One thing is certain though, anxiety is often, but not always, anxiety is often there where the breakdown in these in the performance of these roles occurs. And these roles are learned according to some symbolic interactionist theories. Um, they're learned through various modes of childhood socialization. This is where we take from such thinkers as Freud perhaps, but also um, George, one thinker named George Herbert Mead. I'm not going to go into their work, a so, an American sociologist named George Herbert Mead, another one named Charles Horton Cooley, for example, uh, all of whom are kind of maybe less Freud, but Mead and Cooley are certainly linked to this tradition of symbolic interactionism. Uh, and you can learn more about these thinkers in other courses. The, all you need to know right now is that these are some of the names associated with the symbolic interactionist tradition. Uh, so that's one particular way of thinking about the family and its well-being or health. You know, take, for example, and we can develop this much more in later classes, the changing social roles uh, and the consequent de-routinization of these roles of men and women, and indeed perhaps other genders as well. What impact does this have on relative health and well-being within the family? It's a, it's a difficult question and uh, any answer to the question will be controversial to somebody. Uh, I quote for a moment the author of our textbook though, or not the author of our textbook, the author of this chapter, more sophisticated renditions of this theory, symbolic interactionism, have posited both positive and negative health consequences for successful role performance, pointing out that some social roles have, oh, sorry, provide more opportunities for material and social reward than others. Okay, so we can see that. Uh, there are consequences in, in our health for how we play our roles. Uh, and how we play these roles or whether or not they're in, in, they have integrity or not, or whether they change or transition or not, have some sort of uh, impact on health. So for example, we can imagine that, you know, cleaning the home or looking after children might in our society be less rewarding financially but also perhaps in terms of health outcomes, if you're working a double work day or something like that, then maybe some other roles. Okay, so that's one way to kind of think about it. Oh no, the trauma of the erasure of existence. There we go, okay. Let's move on to ecological systems theory or ecological, ecological systems perspectives. Well, the symbolic interactionist, um, the symbolic interactionist perspective tends to focus more on roles, as we've seen, the maintenance of those roles as a continuous system, uh, whereby the breakdown in roles has clear health consequences, clear, clear consequences on health income uh, outcomes, but also perhaps incomes for all those linked into the bond associated with a given role. Um, but the ecological systems perspectives do not begin as its focus only on an individual's role and performance or maintenance of roles. It, that's not where it begins. 
So by contrast with the symbolic interactionist perspective, ecological systems theories focus on systems that are composed of networks of, pra uh, of practices of people in interaction with one another. You're not just looking at, to put it very simply, you're not just looking at one person in a given role, you're looking at the whole system, say the family unit as a whole and not just one element of it, like the father or the parent or the child or the caregiver or whatever. You're looking at the, the whole system. So it introduces a sense of ecology that is holism, some sort of healthy perspective, if you like, to the whole thing. So the difference is really that um, the emphasis is not on role performance, but rather on the system of interactions or functions themselves taken broadly. We can speak therefore of a family system as a unit of analysis. So not role, but family system. Um, instead of simply the various individual roles that are fulfilled within a system. A role would only be an element within the wider system, which is in turn a larger, uh, within a larger unit of analysis, a larger framework of interaction. So in other words, we're trying to focus much more on the overarching context within which roles are performed. That's the ecological part of it. So to quote the author, Ecological systems theory is based on the idea that individual development, including health and well being, is determined by the interplay of systems within which individuals and their roles, I'll add, reside. This is the key dif difference. And it's not just a difference, it's a building upon the symbolic interactionist tradition by providing it with an overarching context. It's not just a role, it's many roles that all uh, interact with one another in a way that is, with, that is systematic. It's in a larger overarching system. Uh, and we would include systems of systems because the family is not a system in of itself. The family is included within a larger, say, social system or other institutional systems and so on. So it's more holistic. So that's what's added from the symbolic interactionist uh, perspective to the ecological systems perspective is a sense of holism or context. Okay, well, I have a difficulty here with working across this level of abstraction once again that the author is providing us because we risk when we work at this level of abstraction it produces clean categories and so on but we risk not saying something truthful <laughs> because take for example the work of Irving Goffman who was the exemplary case of the symbolic interactionist perspective well Goffman his most well-known work was about using theater as an analogy for understanding the nature of a given social bond. In other words, he was looking ecologically at the system within which individuals perform their roles. He said there's a front stage within which a role is performed. There's a backstage, there's an audience and the audience will rise up to save an actor who's lost to forgot his line or something like that. So, um, so it, in reality, these perspectives are not as clearly delineated. They're certainly not as mutually exclusive as they appear to be, um, but we're still gonna take them at face value for the purposes of this course. One thing is very interesting about this take on ecological systems theory, it's that it does add to our notions of time and space. Um, it's very enriching in its own way. For example, we can't neglect the fact that within a family system, I'm quoting the author here, mothers may provide care in, in a particular role as social support to young children, but they may do so to the detriment of their own physical and mental health. Um, yet we find at a later time, I'm quoting, that children are also social supports later in life which fought to, to, um, to mothers, which fathers may lack. So we can see that the internal health and well-being outcomes associated with the family system change, change from say time one to time two. So systems theory tends to add um, some notion of time 
a little bit. Uh, and it's from within the system's perspective that we finally get the following concepts. Work family balance or work family fit, however you want to put it. Uh, this is because we're thinking of work and family as systems within an overarching ecological framework. We can now think of work and family not necessarily as two separate things, but as systems that impact one another within an overarching system of well being. So we can think of an ecosystem in this sense, and ecosystems uh, survive by producing goals that are in harmony with one another. You know, so we ask the question of how these systems interact to produce some sort of stability, integrity, or harmony. Okay, so that's ecological systems theory in a nutshell, but what are the limitations here? If the symbolic interactionist perspective has as its limitation an inability to see the wider context of the familial system or the overarching systems within which roles are performed, um, then the ecological system and the ecological systems corrects that shortcoming. Then the shortcoming of the ecological systems perspective is that it's limited in that it can miss an emphasis on disparities, on inequalities, on resource differentiation, on conflicts that are happening. Um, and that's where conflict theory can come in to offer a nice uh, supplement, another added vantage point. But we'll get to that in a moment. Let's focus on the life course perspective. So the systems theory approach hitherto discussed has taken in uh, already some sort of life course perspective, which has allowed it to think about um, family systems in time and space. I quote the author, The life course perspective expands on systems theories by paying particular attention to time variations in individuals' activities over their life, individual changes over time, and connections between early life and later life outcomes. Okay. So you can see that the life course perspective is really allowing us to think about time and changes that can happen throughout time. Um, it's a nice corrective to those theories which freeze the family in a particular moment of time and then declare some sort of a universal position about families from that one time. Um, it adds to the holism of ecological systems theory uh, by suggesting that one can also take a holistic perspective in terms of the entire life course, all of the various transitions that people go through in their life and how decisions made at one particular moment in life will impact the health out outcomes of another particular moment in life. Take, for example, the fact that dropping out of university to raise children at a particular time might function for the family at that particular time, but it has later health outcomes or consequences for the health and well being financially or um, psychologically or whatever else um, to that family and to individuals within that family. The author writes, and I'm quoting, I'm not going to write this quote. Leaving the labor force early to rear children may result in cumulative disadvantages for both the labor market and the family, end quote. So, you know, if we don't take a life course perspective, we might miss the curious fact that a lot of young mothers withdraw from the labor force at a time when it would otherwise be advantageous to invest oneself into a career. It has an incredible effect on later earnings and on the ability to obtain appropriate health care, particularly in America, uh, to deal with stress and so on. But still, within the life course perspective, we don't address this underlying structural the underlying structural problems, the conflicts that might give rise to inequalities, 
and so on, at the level of gender, at the level of class and race and so on. This is why the final perspective is really important according to our author. So now we're at conflict theory. Conflict theory focuses on resource and power uh, differences within a society or system uh, within a life course and uh, according to various roles. So it seems to me that conflict theory strives to locate uh, inherent contradictions, conflicts, um, zones of antagonism, rupture, um, power differentials, and so on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's all kinds of ways of putting it, right? Um, that are fundamental for understanding what gives rise to social structures, to social bonds, to social institutions. You know, we can achieve a semblance of harmony, of ecology, of well being, precisely by concealing the fact that there are power differentials. And that's a limitation of the ecological systems theory perspective is that, you know, there may be harmony, there may appear to be harmony, but at what cost? There may be um, a silent oppression or exploitation, or there may be an unacknowledged differential that's allowing there to be something like peace or harmony in a, in a, in a system. Um, and that's the real violence of peacetime in some sense. The violence of peacetime is the fact that, that we may not be acknowledging the violence that has to be at play in order for us to feel as though there's a harmonious system in place, family system, um, uh, economic, or political system, and so on. So conflict perspectives focus on struggles of competing groups, they, groups that are struggling um, or an antagonistic to one another due to their social location. So conflict could have to do with our social location. Uh, by social location, I mean, we might be located differently in terms of our social bond. We might be on the periphery. Um, we might be marginal or we might be at the center of the social bond. We might be in the rural area or we might be in the city. We might be out in the West Coast or East Coast or we might be in the in central Canada, for example. Social location can be a way of thinking about conflict. Resources, resource access to resource could be a way of thinking about conflict. We maybe some people have more and some people have less. Uh, maybe some people have access to more capital or or resources of some type, while others don't. Conflict could have to do with identities. Um, some people may have identities or roles or uh, that are that are favorable to society to um, or that um, are more competently or uh, more believable more believed than others and so on well within the dimension of the family a conflict perspective would ask as frederick engels did who was the colleague of um, karl marx i'm sure i spelled his name correctly actually uh, you know, what profound inequalities have given rise to the structural makeup of the modern family? Why, um, why do inequalities exist that stabilize the contemporary family? What function does the family even have for stabilizing an overarching system of, uh, of conflict or uh, of inequality or something like that? Why is certain work valued and other work not valued? So we have some perspectives here from the author. I think that concludes our four perspectives from the author. Um, but I do have some issues with these four perspectives, as I've said. Uh, you know, who are the major theorists and what evidence is there that they link into these perspe perspectives in the way that the author describes? Are all of these perspectives mutually exclusive or is there some overlap? I, I tend to think there's a lot of overlap. Um, there's all kinds of questions we could ask uh, but keeping it simple, this could help orient us a little bit in the course. Uh, I think what I'm going to do now is actually um, just because I can feel how long I've been talking now, not really dip too much into the psychology chapter, if at all, uh, except to say that the psychology chapter tends to focus a lot more um, on, uh, say, domains of studying uh, 
the family, and, and we can think about it develop, developmentally, you know, um, studying the family in terms of key periods of development. You can think about it socially in terms of social roles and attitudes and power and, and group interactions and so on. Or you can think about it in terms of um, uh, the clinic and directly treating. So uh, uh, issues having to do with individuals. So, you know, I'm, I'm not really going to focus on the psychological um, stuff because um, although I have a lot here, I want it to say it just doesn't seem uh, all that pertinent right now, given where we've been going. Um, instead, what I want to do is just quickly review and then add the fifth perspective and end the, end the class there. So uh, we have four broad sociological perspectives. And if some of you have read the very, very short chapter on psychological perspectives, you can consider those psychological domains. They're not as important as the sociological perspectives. It seems to me that each of these sociological perspectives complicate the others, demonstrate limitations, but also add something to the previous perspectives. So you can think of moving from the symbolic interactionist to the conflict perspective as, as a way of um, uh, overcoming a lot of the limitations that were there in the first three. Um, the problem with all four of these perspectives though, is that they don't take seriously the psychoanalytic focus that I opened today's lecture with the psychoanalytic focus on death as the found and the periphery experiences of death and suffering and illness as the foundation for and the limit to health. I think this is an essential theoretical contribution and that's why I'm adding it as the fifth perspective, uh, namely what I'm calling the psychoanalytic perspective. Um, the psychoanalytic perspective, just to review what I said at the beginning, argues, and we see it also in the, what I would call the psychoanalytic sociology of Sigmund Bowman, but also in the work of Freud and in Durkheim and others that we've cited. It, it argues that death is formative to social bonds and that health is a life strategy. To put it very simply, the psychoanalytic perspective reminds us to think in terms of time and space as paradoxical forms of dealing with the specter of death. Um, so we, we construct our life strategies in time and in space. Um, you know, being too close to one another, having a too intense social bond is in many respects uh, quite destructive. Um, it's, it's much more problematic than being too far from one another in our social bonds and being without time, that is being suspended in a time without conclusion, without a sense of finitude is also more destructive than being a mere mortal who knows his or her or their time is coming. This is why psychoanalysis offers us some counterintuitive points that shake up the traditional uh, sociological perspective. So it, it adds a... Uh, perspectives, time, and space. Uh, so the psychoanalytic perspective focuses precisely on a concept of uh, death, what we might refer to as a concept of lack, if you like, lack as death. Um, where and when does lack get installed? or doesn't it get installed? What is the life strategy that we must implement that makes society possible? Uh, so for example, Freud in his book, uh, The Civilization, or Civilization and Its Discontents. Yeah, I'm really at the end here, but I, I can feel myself rambling a bit, so I really wanna stop, but I'm just gonna say Civilization and Its Discontents from Freud, but also in his book, Totem, Oh, wait, what is it called? Yeah, Totem and Taboo. These are two key works from Freud that where he argued that the price we pay to be a member of a society or, uh, or a member of civilization 
is a certain amount of discontent, a lack, a certain amount of death and suffering that makes possible our admission into a social bond. To be within a society is to give up the intensely proximate connections that we have with one another and to witness the, uh, the desire to reconnect with one another. And I think that's what social distancing is fundamentally all, all about. Okay, I'm going to stop here, and um, I look forward to going through the next chapters with you uh, next week. Uh, if you're wondering how to deal with a lot of this abstraction, I would say focus on the things that are right on the whiteboard and, uh, and try and simplify it in your own way. Take my abstractions and turn them into key points. Uh, wonderful. I look forward to talking to uh, some of you by email, and uh, I'll, you'll see me next week. Bye-bye.